It's very funny, Andrew, because I'm here in town and you're debating with the private equity and other guys about AI. And a lot of them are saying, oh, it's not even having a big enough effect to affect margins. And I, I think it will. And then you're all the way over here. Oh, it's actually so good that it's going to kill everyone. And I, I think it's probably somewhere in the middle where it is going to have a big impact. I'm not as worried about that. So, but one of the things he said, and it, maybe you can help us, is that he said that the folks who are running these AI LLMs, these large language models, were all in the in that camp, meaning that that that, that I think it was every single one of them was in the scary camp, yeah. and they're the ones who are actually doing it. The, a lot of the people, a lot of the people building the model companies are very optimistic that they're going to be able to keep making these things much much better. Uh, I hope they're right because we need them to keep getting better to have a really positive impact. I guess if you believe that it's exponential and they're going to get better forever, then it could change everything. I don't think these things are exponential. I think there's just a lot of other things we have to figure out before it changes the whole world. Is it possible that it, we could hit the singularity with AI and we, we could all live forever instead of all dying? Isn't there a half, <laughs> isn't there a half full uh, side of things? You know, I, I don't think singularity is really how it's going to work. I, I don't think the world just goes in exponentials and completely changes. I think there's more like what about so you get some sort of a hybrid, a, you know, a, a I don't know. We've been thinking about if it's part hardware and part software on a, on a human being. We, we, listen, the, the bio world right now, we're figuring out a lot of stuff about aging, and AI is probably going to be a big, That's big help I was, there. I, I don't, I, I don't think it. I mean, yes, there so are all going to be half of us are going to be dead, or half of us are going to live forever. There are new threats where you get crazy terrorists doing things in bio. You got to be right, careful. Right. But, but Fauci? overall. <laughs> That's a separate topic. <laughs> AI in education. So the party that uh, we were both at during South by Southwest, we went to that big dinner party. And uh, I was sat next to this fascinating guy and he was giving this, what might as well have been a 90 minute long fucking TED talk. It's probably Joe Lamont. Correct. Um, <laughs> I was Love keeping Joe. it, I was keeping it, uh, Sorry. keeping it uh, quite bad. I mean, you're, you're better friends with him, so you can say what you want. Um, he's great. I, I really appreciate it as well that he wants to sort of be doing the thing behind the scenes without putting himself in front of the scenes, no matter how much I try and bring him on the podcast. Yeah, I shouldn't, I shouldn't, I shouldn't talk about it. No, he yeah, likes it. Stuff. I mean, it was a, it was a fucking dinner party, but it, me and the sort of four people that were within earshot before the next, you know, whatever territory of conversation sort of bubble that took over each one, each person had a it, territory grab. This is such a key thing to push education forward this way. And the only reason it's not happening at greater scale is because there's no market mechanism right now of competition in education. Just because you have the best thing doesn't mean people are allowed to go to it. So we're trying to put market mechanisms. In can, you, can you explain what it is that he's trying to do? Yeah. And, and, you know, in general, it turns out that if you personalize uh, the app and personalize the learning where you can map out like an ontology or a schema of everything that the kid needs to learn in an area, you can, and, and you can have something interacting with them. You could see where they're good and where they're not good. And a lot of times what happens, for example, is a kid will get like way behind in one area. They're like two grades behind and they never get caught up because they never, no one ever goes back and teaches them the basic skills. Mm. But if you have an app that's really good at like measuring and teaching, then it turns out with two hours a day, you're actually able to get kids way, way ahead. And I think you can get the majority of the kids, you know, in, 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 in alpha school, for example, I think are at 99 percentile. And some of them are, are, are even years ahead because they're able to go ahead and this, with this personalized AI learning that like teaches, you know, to how they need to learn and, and, and to what they need to know. And it's, it's amazing because in two hours a day, they do the academics and then they have time for projects and for life skills. And mm. I think there's going to be schools they're doing where like kids get to play video games because these young men aren't studying otherwise. Being like, designed by the guys now. that did Fortnite, I think. He's doing, he's doing some really cool things with that. There's, there's other schools for sports and for kids who want to get way ahead in sports, you're going to stay ahead in academics for two hours. Then you're going to train and you're going to be the best of the sport you want to play. So I think there's just all sorts of cool new frameworks and, and we could try out in education and it's it's awesome to see successful entrepreneur applying and putting a lot of resources towards this you know for our country it's really amazing yeah i i found it very interesting he was talking about the massively reduced prevalence of adhd in these schools because if you're running around for four hours a day and you're only strapped to something which is probably a bit more engaging and is at your level of of education and is helping you to 100 percent, all these kids are just being tortured i, I think a lot of the way we teach School right now is just like this torturous daycare that's terrible for kids. And to actually exactly to two hours a day of the, at your level, you need to know you're going to be more focused, more interested than being able to run around, be in charge. I think I think the Alpha School model is built on top of what's called the Acton School model, and and Acton Academy is this really cool breakthrough 
uh, where they just basically gave the kids a lot more control of the school and then got to build their own constitution, their own frameworks, give them a lot more responsibility, which I think is a very cool kind of libertarian model. For uh, the inmates are running the asylum. That's what it's you're telling awesome. me. It's awesome. And it creates this like responsibility. And it's just, it works. It works if it's done right. You still have guides and adults there, but it works. And then, and then I think on top of that, he's put like competitions. He's put like really good AI. And, and listen, it's just like smart people getting together and building. And this is what education clearly to me should look like, you know, mm -hmm. in 10, 20 years in America. And the real question at this point is how do we roll it out to other places? And unfortunately, we have some really powerful special interests that don't exist for our kids. They exist for their own employment and the school administrations right now. And so that that's going to be a big battle in our country. Is this Department of Education stuff? A little bit. It's much more just like the, just the teachers unions in general and the administrations locally in the school districts. Texas, for example, has something like 1,200 school districts and they're not accountable and they're overpaid and it's just like in terms of these administrators and stuff and i don't even know what they're doing it's just it's just the whole thing is just like very sloppy and there's a big war right now for school choice in texas but we're only fighting over putting one billion dollars towards school choice which is not big enough anyway so mm -hmm. it's like hopefully we can make that a lot bigger next time and just get a lot more parents able to send their kids like the ideal situation is the middle class can afford to reallocate the money the government's giving them for education to go to one of alpha schools or another school of their choice and not be stuck on something that's not as good. Is know? there a place for AI in higher ed? Yeah, you know, in, in, in general, in general, I think a lot of like any kind of learning of math and science and any of that like can be driven forward with AI and you're going to start seeing a lot more of that too. Um, you know, and there's probably lots of ways in which I think people already are learning in higher ed, like mm. what would Plato think of this based on this? And Where uh, can't it interject? What, what, what will it struggle at? You know, you've thought a lot about the university experience. You guys are trying to give a more classical sort of approach, I suppose. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of the university experience is about being around other young adults who are exploring the world and learning and, and, and interesting professors and having an intellectual environment where you're where you're you're socializing with and and you're and you're exploring ideas with with other people and and, and I, th I think it's like it's really important to have this in person experience. I think that's that's a key part of what makes universities this amazing thing. And so I think I think I think that's not going to be something you just have with AI. It's, it's it's not you know you have to have people around you. You have to be you're learning. You have to be debating things in a classroom. And can I, can AI make some of that better and augment it? Certainly. I mentioned. Uh... Uh, university for me was kind of like Navy SEAL boot camp for socialization, but it lasted five years. And um, <laughs> it, you know, it, 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 it is, it's the people's skills. Oh yeah. For the no, most I, part. I, I, uh, I was in the dorky fraternity at Stanford and I have friends who were in the cool fraternity. So then sometimes they would still be my friend back then, which was nice. Mm -hmm. they ended up working for me later. So it's good. But, but like but we were in the dorky fraternity and I remember going to spring break and back then my friends like, Joe, you can't tell the girls that you're a computer scientist. It's not cool. You have to pretend you're like American studies or something. And, I have some bad stories. We figured it out eventually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you seen what Jordan Peterson's doing with Peterson Academy? A little bit. Tell me about it. Uh, it's, he's trying to give a university level education online and it, he's got some really, really interesting uh, lecturers, uh, teachers, I suppose. And they're trying to get certification and they're trying to sort of assess whether or not people have gone through the course and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great, but kind of like the realization that maybe many businesses have come to understand post COVID that there are many intangibles that are born out from water cooler talk and, yeah. and from yeah, being, being around other people for me, if, if at least, at least if you're trying to do something that's like the high end Western civilization university experience, like, like that's Oxford, that's Cambridge, it's Harvard, it's Stanford. And these places now are more broken than they were, but, but there's still a lot of wisdom to how they were structured and why they were structured that way and why you had your eating clubs and whether it's a fraternity or some other kind of, you know, group or whatever. I think, I think having these, these things in your life are tough. So I think, I think what Jordan, Jordan's a really talented guy. I'm a fan of his. I think he's going to have something that's very interesting to learn online. And I think, by the way, I think, I think we may do things we learn online too. I think it's a very positive part of that, but it's not the full experience. What do you think about Neuralink? I think it's cool. I think, you know, you know what actually is really neat? There's a bunch of the talent for Neuralink's moved to Austin, where we are. So you know, a lot of this tech talent just, and people have shifted out of California, and so that so a lot of the head people are there, and you know, it's it's, it's they're making amazing progress. It's there's probably all sorts of things you can do with Neuralink eventually, with like you know, people who are paralyzed, to fix that with back pain. With I mean, it's a little bit scary if you really get a high bandwidth into your brain, maybe see what's going on. I don't know. I'm not sure I want to know everything about that. You know, <laughs> I mean, does that worry you at all? Well, I would say I trust Elon and the people working on it, but in general, 
having companies have access directly into the brains of huge numbers of people, if it spreads to be a thing that lots of people are touching, that is a little bit of a scary kind of concept. If you can kind of, you know, overall, it's like really positive, right? Overall, for the near term, 100%. Like, I think these guys, I can even imagine, I'm claustrophobic. I don't know about you. I don't like being stuck in a small space. Imagine if you're paralyzed and you just, all you do is blink your eyes. Yeah. And there's guys who are literally getting this thing and suddenly they're able to effectively like, you know, communicate, play games, like do all these things that otherwise, otherwise they were trapped in their head. I mean, this is like, it's like a God's gift for, for a huge number of people. So it's like, so it's like, is it a good thing? A hundred percent, it's a good thing. But sure, if we're going to speculate thirty years from now where society can go if we're all plugged into our brains, there's, there's, we got to make sure that crazy things don't happen. Obviously. Yeah, yeah you know, I've, I read uh, something a couple of weeks ago saying that uh, it's helping blind people potentially see. 100%. There's all sorts of these amazing things you could do with this. So I think for people who have issues who are injured, and it may even be like Elon said at some point for a really bad back pain or something, you could just adjust it and stuff. So there's lots of really, really, I, th I think we're going towards a golden age. It's really positive. I think whenever there's these positive things, there's always some negative possibilities. And it doesn't mean we should stop doing the positive things, but we should just keep those in mind and do our best to make sure we avoid them. How good is AI going to be really? And my intuition has been that it ha it's like a, an asymptote, right? Where it just like gets a little better, a little better, but stuff, but it hasn't yet. It's like kept making these jumps. And so I, I'm both, I'm really excited. I'm a little bit scared. My intuition is that it still does like kind of hit a wall at some point or at least slow down a lot because there's, I don't think the universe works in exponentials. I think it works in S shapes where it like goes up mm -hmm. for a while and comes over. I just, I just don't think the universe is that simple that we've just figured everything out and then we're going to have this crazy super intelligence in like five or 10 years. My view is that it keeps getting a little bit better and that it's good enough to like raise productivity a lot and it's a very good kind of happy medium. But, but you know, a lot of my smartest friends think we're kind of birthing the Messiah basically. And it's like this religion for them. And, and that's, that's really fascinating Do and they scary. speak in that language or you just get the vibe? Some of them speak in that language. Most of them don't use that term because they're because they're because they're secular, right? This is like this is a but but for me, it's messianic in the way they do speak about it. Like that would be the correct adjective to describe how they're speaking about what's coming in the next ten years. And a few of them use it. Most of them don't. But but and then again, this is not my view. I think I think it's just this majorly important productivity wave, but that doesn't actually completely like you know create a god that's a thousand times smarter than us. But there are some people who think that we're going to get something like that. And if we, if we do, then we're living at the end of times. But that's like a, <laughs> it's what it is. I don't think that's the case. At the end of the month coming up soon, I'm interviewing Mark Andreessen at this Raw Reagan Economic Forum. I'm on the board yeah, of the Reagan Mark. Library. And uh, yeah, really impressive guy. And, you know, he, he has this framework for like different eras that we're in, which I think is like partially true, right? So you had this like, material industrial era for a long time, especially with the industrial revolutions that accelerated and when we built a lot of things. And starting in the 60s and really accelerating in the 70s, all the way through Obama, you basically had the services economy that just grew massively. It changed education, it changed a lot of things. And, and unfortunately, a lot of things, that's when a lot of this stuff leaked in that made it harder to build things. But that stuff didn't get challenged as much because the richest and most powerful people were focused on the services side uh, for quite a while there. And now you have, of course, this energy-based era of like intelligence and robotics and you know all these new possibilities that are just really accelerating right now, right? So I have like one of my favorite companies is like guys for Waymo, right? The self-driving company, a bunch mm -hmm. from left, and they're they're using AI and robotics to basically like take caterpillar machines, like construction machines with no one in them, and build roads and build buildings. And it's like this is clearly already starting to work. It's clearly coming. Like there's so much stuff that's gonna it's be very disinflationary, right? It's gonna bring down the cost of everything in our society if we can make this work. It's gonna it's gonna make people in the middle class live way better. It's, it's just this great energy, but we have to power it with energy. And so I think cheap, cheap energy is really important. I think deregulatory stuff to like allow us to actually build things, to allow us to make healthcare cheaper. Healthcare could be so cheap, Tom, we can compete. Like all these things that are kind of broken, education, healthcare, housing costs, those should all be much cheaper the next 10 or 20 years if the government allows them to be. If the government allows that competition, attacks the crony capitalists that are running everything right now and that are locking in laws against us. So I think I think that's some of the most important stuff to thrive. If AI puts 80 million Americans out of work, how does populism, how does the populist wave we're in now survive such a thing? It's you know, it's a it's a really interesting question of how quickly that happens and what happens alongside it, right? Because I was, you know, we're overlooking here some beautiful farmland down below us. And in the old days, you know, it took twenty times as many people working on those farms. And I think we're all happy that it's not the case, that, that productivity has gone up a lot. And it's actually 
it's funny if you actually want to attack us arrogant tech guys who think we're so great for all things we're doing <laughs> you might say like like joe productivity hasn't gone up very much at all the last 30 years you think you're changing everything is you're just you're distracting people with this stuff like like tech's only, it's only gone up one or two percent a year if you actually get productivity going up three four five percent a year that solves the debt problems. It's caused a disinflation. I mean, this would, this would solve so many things. And so, so you're right. There's there's a there's a give and take where you don't want everyone out of work at once. But we desperately need productivity to go up in this economy. Well, so in your opinion, what is the time horizon for this stuff? I mean, we we had this piece in Axios last week. We talked about it on the show, uh, basically saying, look, this is this is going to happen in the next one to three years that that you'll have 20 percent of the workforce put out of uh, out of work. Um, and there was a there was a Another piece that we talked about, which was written by Joel Kotkin, which talked about uh, because right now AI is, is helping people do their jobs but very quickly, it'll it'll replace those jobs. And a lot of those are, uh, you know, sort of well-educated. It would create a sort of democratic underclass, right? The guy who fixes your pipes is not going to be replaced by AI, but the person, the journalist, the podcaster, maybe, uh, <laughs> you know, some of these <laughs> folks in the, in the information space, uh, they're the ones who might be hit hardest. You know, I mean, I think eventually this goes into all sectors, but it's the question you asked that we've been through these waves a few times, right? And so you had the whole internet wave, the internet boom, it was a giant bubble. And whenever people are in the middle of these bubbles, think back to 1998, 1999, when those things first really got going and the internet was really accelerating, it was like everything is going to change in the next three or four years. And you know what's interesting? All that new economy, new paradigm, remember we talked about new paradigm 25 years ago? That was actually right. It just took a lot longer than anyone thought. And listen, AI is going to change a lot of things pretty fast. I, I actually don't think it's going to show up in productivity as much as I would like it to. So it's funny. I'm on the other side of this thing where I'm worried it's not going to be fast enough. It's going to take a longer time because, I mean, the real world is just a complicated place. It's hard to put these things in. So is it going to start hitting different areas? 100%. But, but is it going to change everything in three years? I find that very unlikely. I think, if anything, the bigger battle is how do we get past the regulatory frameworks to actually let us improve productivity in healthcare, make healthcare cheaper for everyone. How do we allow ourselves to build things better so we can have cheaper products and goods for everyone? It's going to take a long time to be allowed to do these things. And and so so I actually I'd be surprised if if there's just massive job losses. That's not how I see it. 